Good day. So good to be here together with each other. And as I usually mention, I am grateful uh, for you to invite me in your, into your world, wherever you are, whether you're watching and listening or listening and to this particular message. I thank you so much. And here we are. Uh, well past, well, not too far past Easter and into the springtime in our area here uh, of Alberta and pretty well in Canada. And hopefully uh, you have had a, uh, a blessed week. And as we today pick up where we left off last week in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, we're back there today and we will continue along that journey. And as we, as we look at that letter, so please turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4 or in your phone app or iPad app or however you are got your scripture in front of you. And uh, as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, we see in the whole of the letter that Paul, uh, in his letters, reminding us, as it was in Ephesus, it is today. Because the biggest issue that was going on there, well, the issue that was going on there for this reason for this letter was this false teachers and their teaching. Now, uh, today is the same thing. False teachers uh, who call themselves Christians uh, and their teaching continue to offer up uh, what I like to call Jesus plus. Something else in order. Jesus plus something else in order to uh, receive salvation. And it's, and it's in Paul's letter that we have this insight to the false teaching of some in Ephesus who were forbidding marriage at the time there and requiring abstinence for some certain foods. So here we have Jesus plus. And it goes something like this. One must keep rule number one through ten. And then and only then you will be right before God. That's basically what they were teaching. When we consider 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 5 in its context, Paul has identified for us the spiritual reality and deception behind all false teaching in the church, past, present, and into the future. And he calls it there in verse 1, if you have your Bible in front of you, deceiving spirits. These are demonic spirits who through deception trick some, as Paul would say about it, to abandon their faith. Uh, if you look at this, it really means to apostate, to turn around and walk away from their faith. Jesus said that the false prophets himself, Jesus said that the false prophets uh, would be with God's people and have been with God's people from the very beginning and will continue until he returns. You can check that out in the Gospels. And I want to talk about a modern day false prophet. One particular one in mind, and I'm not saying this to be judgmental, I'm just saying this based on the facts and the Bible. And uh, this one particular false teaching has really literally, in my opinion, been insulting the Word of God. And actually, it's not my opinion, it's the Word of God's opinion. He's been insulting that very Word for at least 55 years, and his name is Kenneth Copeland. Um, one, of the, one particular teacher is Kenneth Copeland. He's recognized as a proponent and a, of the prosperity gospel and a word of faith movement teacher and preacher. And Copeland, along with his wife and others in his ministry, have consistently and effectively deceived hundreds of thousands of people. You know, if you think about it, friends, it's one thing to say something incorrectly about God or the Bible or once or maybe a few times, but to continue to do so for more than 50 years with absolutely no sign of repentance, with no admission of error, it's very clear that this false teacher and his supporters are in bondage to deceiving spirits because this is a spiritual issue. And I just want to share a small sampling of some of the things he says about God, the God of the Bible. He said that the biggest failure in the Bible is God. He also said that God is a spirit being with a body complete with eyes and eyelids, a mouth and feet. And that God is a being that stands somewhere between, uh, you know, six foot two and six foot three. And when it comes to believers, 
you and me, he teaches consistently and often that you don't have a God in you, you are one. These are his own words. And today, Kenneth Copeland continues to preach a prosperity gospel and definitely a word of faith teacher. And it is very obvious, very easy to see that it's worked out very well for him and his wife and his family. The conservative estimate of his net uh, worth runs around $850 million plus dollars. And keep in mind, this is tax-free dollars that's run through the ministry. And this wealth really has been acquired on the backs of those he has deceived for many decades. So we have this 85-year-old or so man who considered himself qualified to preach the Word of God, who sadly is clearly in bondage to the doctrines, doctrine of demons. And rather than be angry, which we should be upset when people are deceived and when God is represented in incorrect and false ways, we really should be praying for Kenneth Copeland, his family, and any of these false teachers in our current Christian world, and all who follow them and believe them, that God would grant them repentance and bring them to salvation. Last week I, I mentioned a quote, and I, I just want to mention it again, sort of to summarize this introduction. And it went something like this. Um, it's easier to fool people than to convince them they have been fooled. It's easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. And I think that's a, a true, true saying. So please turn your Bibles, um, hopefully you have them open, to chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. And just to have the context, even though we're dealing with chapter ver verses 6 to 10 here, pardon me, we, wanna, we will read 1 to 10 just to get the whole look at it here. So verse uh, 1 in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Verse 6, if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Old wives tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is, that is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And now as we spend some time uh, going through these verses together, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us your spirit to illuminate and to understand. And will it be put deeply into our lives, into our hearts, and then translated into our hands and feet not only amongst ourselves, but certainly in our communities and beyond. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, our text, as we read through it, you may have noticed, you may not, has, presents a contrast for us. A contrast between uh, false teachers, false disciples, with true biblical teachers and true disciples of Jesus. When we look at verse 6, we know that Paul was addressing Timothy when he said to Timothy, if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters. Another way we can say this is if, if you explain things. The question is what things? Well, the things that he was talking about in verse 1 through 5. And quite frankly, I would say even some of the things that he's talking about in the chapters before. But specifically, we can say 1 to 5. However, while Paul was writing... To Timothy, the things that he pointed out were also to be pointed out to the brothers and sisters. It's in the same verse, verse 1. That is the church in Ephesus. Now, while the letter was written to a pastor called Timothy, 
It was to be read and explained to the whole church. And here's the point that I'm trying to get across here with this. The biblical instructions we have in this letter, and particularly in these verses, is for all believers, for you and for me. Not only for Timothy and not only for pastors and teachers in the church today. It's for all of us. And Timothy, as Paul said to him, by carrying out these teachings and passing them on to his brothers and sisters, is a good minister of Christ Jesus. Is a good minister. And this phrase, good minister, can also be translated good servant or worthy servant. And clearly, these mean the same thing. Friends, all believers are good servants or worthy servants if they understand the spiritual reality behind all false teaching, empty human philosophies, godless myths, old wives' tales. They're all supported and pushed ahead by deceiving spirits. And Paul is, 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 is not mincing any words because he, he says that those who teach the things taught by demons are hypocritical liars. That's a pretty strong statement. Whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Your conscience that, we're all, that God has given all people, we're born with it, that helps us to navigate the truth and lies, the good and the bad. And if, if our consciences are seared, that is full of sin, we cannot hear it. Anyways, you might be saying to yourself, if you were with us last week, and maybe even today you might be saying, well, pastor, so far it's kind of bad news. Well, that's true. This is hard stuff to consider because it's also happening in our time as well. So what, what can we do to be prepared and ready to deal with this kind of spiritual deception and those who promote it? Well, I'm grateful that you ask. You know, some things are pretty obvious to us. But Paul here doesn't leave Timothy in the Ephesian church, nor us today floundering around aimlessly in uncharted waters. And the best way I want to sort of bring this across to you is by three points. Point number one, uh, we're going to use the word nourishment slash nourish. Uh, point number two, training. And point number three, mission. So let's look at these one at a time. The first point, nourishment. As we look at this, requirement for spiritual nourishment, we will see as we continue that it's a very foundational for the believer. It's where we all need to be at to start with. Because we need that foundation, that spiritual nourishment, and you'll see what I mean as we look at some things in a minute here, before we can do as Paul exhorted Timothy and us today to train ourselves to be godly. We see that in verse 7. Train yourself to be godly. Before we can go on mission, we need spiritual nourishment. And the word nourish is translated from the Greek, which means nurture, to train up. And this should make sense to us. So let's look at a 21st century example of nourishment. A different kind of nourishment, nonetheless nourishment. Pittsburgh Penguin captain Sidney Crosby. Uh, I'm a hockey fan and I thought about him and decided to share some of this with you. As he continues year in and year out to perform as one of the elite hockey players in his generation, when he plays hockey, uh, according to some of my sources I read, burn, burns anywhere from 3,000 to 4,000 calories a game. And he plays a lot of ice time. So that would be the same with others who play that amount of ice time that Sidney Crosby does. But in order to maintain this uh, you know, elite status in hockey for so many years, uh, he has a daily intake that require, daily intake that requires about five to six thousand calories per day. And how does he get this? Well, for example, a typical breakfast for, for Sid the kid, we'll call him that, would include oatmeal, eggs, bacon or sausage, and protein smoothie. All of those things. Not just one or two, the whole enchilada. But here's the point. Paul, Timothy, you, me, all believers need spiritual nourishment. Now eggs and bacon and sausage and oatmeal and protein smoothies are healthy and good nourishment for our bodies. The spiritual nourishment that we need are right here. We read in the text. 
that Paul talks about the truth of faith and the good teaching that we find in the Bible. You know, as you think about it, the world, let's just think about this together, the world offers a smorgasbord of spiritual food, doesn't it? Back in the 1980s, closer to the uh, late 1990s, 1980s, I say, 1990s, pardon me, when our kids were younger, my wife's and, and my kids, our kids were younger, from time to time after church, we would go to a restaurant, at that time we were living in Moose Jaw, called Bonanza. And Bonanza was known, was known for its large smorgasbord, smorgasbord. And there you could find everything imaginable. Soups, salads, meats, breads, desserts, etc., etc. And from one prize, you could almost pick from what seemed to me as an obscene amount of food. Well, friends, the world presents us with a smorgasbord of spiritual food, spiritual nourishment. Anything that fits your tastes and preferences. And like Bonanza, you can go back and over and over again, especially if you have hungry teenagers. And you can even pick something you've never tried before, something new, something different. And when you think about the practical terms of these kinds of food smorgasbords and the issues we have today in obesity in the first world, people eating fast food day after day and filling up to overflow with empty calories. You know, the saying, oh, you are what you eat, is true. But here it is in a nutshell, brothers and sisters, filling up with these godless myths and old wives' tales of spiritual food offered by so many different people and false teachers, etc., day by day, and trying out new spiritual fads in our culture, and even those that are promoted in many churches today, will make you and me spiritually obese and unfit. So what are the truths of the faith? What is the good teaching that Paul is speaking about in these verses? Another way we could say good teaching then is good doctrine. Let's look at another letter of his, Second uh, Timothy. He writes to Timothy and there in that second letter to Timothy, he gives him a final charge as he closes off the letter to his uh, dear friend Timothy. And he said this to Timothy, Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know, from those from, you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, or in Christ Jesus. This is the good doctrine, the good teaching of the Holy Scriptures of the Bible. We look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, and maybe, I hope you remember the story, and if not, here it is. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It's the beginning, just before he started his ministry, three-year ministry, and after 40 days and nights of fasting, the most obvious statement in the Bible is before us, it tells us that he was hungry. Of course he would be hungry. And the devil came to Jesus and tempted Jesus by saying to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Basically he was saying to Jesus, just say the word, you can chow down on a Big Mac. Or if you want, why don't you try the new uh, and improved cheeseburger or that different salad over there. You just have to say the word. You're the creator and you could have your fill of many choices. And how did Jesus answer? He quoted the Bible to the devil, to Satan. He said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. There he was quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. The psalmist, as he's considering the word of God, the Bible, said, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Friends, if you want to be prepared and able to recognize what is false and what is true, not only do we need to have an operating conscience, but if you want to be able to discern those things that can lead you astray, if you want to be aware of the false things that are presented as spiritual food in our culture and in some churches, you and I must be grounded in the truths of the faith, which are found in the good teaching, the good doctrines of the Bible. Friends, this is our spiritual nourishment. This is our foundation 
for everything in life. We go to 7 to 9, verses 7 to 9. So when we are spiritually nourished with a healthy diet of spiritual food, then we train. Then we train. Paul puts it this way, train yourself to be godly. You have your spiritual nourishment, your foundation. You practice all that by you know, praying, reading the Bible, uh, fasting from time to time, going to church, studying the Bible, being uh, accountable to your brothers and sisters. All this, all of that, that's our spiritual nourishment. Then we train. We move on to training. We, we do both of those things at the same time. We go back to Sidney Crosby. He is noted as a hockey player, a professional hockey player, who has an intense tra training regime. Crosby is 5'11 and 200 pounds, and he's certainly not the biggest player on the ice. But when you watch him, he regularly, more often than not, outmuscles his opponents off the puck. So how does he do this? How does Sid the Kid do this? Well, he trains his body. In hours and hours in the gym. He trains outside of the gym for hours and hours. He's working his legs with compound exercises. He's running steep hills. He's doing wind sprints. He's crossovers, back pedals, many, many things. He's training on the ice, drill after drill, practice after practice, by himself, with his team, on and on, with a trainer. And Crosby builds this tremendous power in his legs. And all this training then translates to speed on the ice, moving those larger prayer, pl players off the puck. He's, he's a magician in the corners. And Crosby's self-discipline, his intense training, his, spirit, his physical nourishment, his natural talent, his puck handling skill, his game vision, has led his team to multiple Stanley Cups. Paul understood that believers must have self-discipline. We look at his first letter to the Corinthians, and Paul used something that was very familiar in his context in the first century. The Olympians of his day, competing in the games of his day. And for those who compete in the games, Paul said they go into strict training. And the Olympians who were self-disciplined and put in the strict training competed for the prize. And Paul called that prize a crown that will not last. But for the believer, Paul said, you run in such a way to get the prize. You run, you, you, you go into strict training. Why? So that we can get the prize. But it's not a crown that will not last forever, it's a, uh, that will, will only last a short time. It's a crown that will last forever. See, Paul was self-disciplined. In the very same letter, he said, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it a slave so that I have, when I, after I have preached to others, pardon me, I myself will not be disqualified for the price. Today, Olympians train hard, don't they? For years, for a brief moment. For a brief moment at the games, for opportunity to win a medal. And there's only three medals, isn't there? Gold, silver, and bronze. Many competitors, three winners. And it's interesting when you think about it, that one day it will be but a small annotation forgotten in some obscure book on a dusty shelf. Nobody will remember them. But Paul was right about that, wasn't he? Physical training is of some value if you're competing in the games or if you're playing for the Stanley Cup. But godliness... Pursuing holiness and righteousness, obeying the commands of God, following Jesus, obeying him and loving others and loving your neighbors and loving God most of all, first of all. That has value for all things, Paul says, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So the question is, how do we train to be godly? Well, we start with a healthy spiritual diet. We need healthy spiritual nourishment. And that's a, a nourishment on the truths of the faith, which we find in the good teaching of the Word of God in the Holy Bible. And believers then train for a crown that will last, that has value not only for today, but for eternity. Godliness, Paul says, has a value for all things. You go back to Jesus, 
for his commentary about this very same thing. One day Jesus was teaching from the Mount. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. He was teaching about the Kingdom of God. He's teaching that the Kingdom of God is not of this world. That we should store up treasures in heaven, not here, because here the moss and the vermins will destroy them, but the treasures in heaven will not be destroyed by the moss and the vermins. Because he makes this point, where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. What you treasure in your heart, what you treasure in your heart, that's where you're following. See, Jesus exhorts you and me not to worry about our lives in that sermon, what we'll eat or drink, about our bodies, or the clothes that we wear. And he speaks about his creation. He says, look at the birds. They do not plant nor harvest or store things in a barn. Yet our Father, he says, in heaven feeds them. Then he asks you and me, are you not more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? That's rhetorical. No, you can't. Then Jesus points us to the flowers of the field. They put in no labor or effort. Then he talks about Solomon, who was the wisest and the most wealthiest man and king in all of history. He considers him poorly dressed compared to the flowers of the field. Yet even the flowers and all their splendor are here one day and gone tomorrow. So don't worry about your clothes. Don't worry about your food. You know why? Here's Paul's point in a different way. Your Heavenly Father knows what you need. And Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So moving on at the last verse, verse 10. Nourishment and training not only protects us from false teaching and the influence of an ungodly culture, it also prepares us to be godly. But there's one more piece. And the reason we seek nourishment and train is for the mission. Paul said that is why we labor and strive. We, like Paul, don't run like someone running aimlessly, don't know where we're going. We don't run after the next and best spiritual fad that so many call, so many so-called Christians gladly buy into. We don't fight the bo- like the boxer beating the air, spending our efforts in vain and human striving. No, we get down to business. We get the right nourishment and train. We labor and strive. We labor and struggle. Why? Because we put our hope in the living God. See, while the world sees Jesus Christ as another option and a smorgasbord of spiritual choices, we know what Jesus said about himself. In John 14, 16, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one goes to the Father except through me. That's the message. That's the mission that we have. Why the spiritual nourishment? Why the strict uh, uh, training? I'll just leave you as I close with three, three things to remember if you can. One, we do all that to discern the true from the false. Two, discern the truth from a lie. Two, to be godly. To be the salt and light in a dark and sinful world. Three, to be on mission. If you read the book of Acts, you see that wherever Paul went, he preached the good news of Jesus Christ. And Paul, for all his efforts and his dedication and his love for Jesus... He didn't get a $6 million mansion for his effort as Copeland has. And by the way, I'm not against money. But money that is basically stolen on the backs of other people, that's not good. But anyways, he didn't get that $6 million mansion. What did Paul get? He got suffering, he got pain, he got prison, he got rejection, and at the end of all, he had his head removed from his neck. See, Paul nourished and trained in the good teaching of the Bible, obeyed his Savior, who commands his people, you and me, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you feed us the spiritual nourishment. You give us the spiritual nourishment. We find it in your word. You, your, your Holy Spirit abides with us and, 
and teaches us and informs us. And, and we are, as your word says, uh, from moment to moment being sanctified, becoming more and more like your son, Jesus. And we thank you so much. Lord, we live in a, a very difficult time in this world when it comes to being a, a person of faith, especially in our post-Christian uh, era here in the West. More and more pressure to, to uh, bow down to the, the flavor of the day and the culture. But Lord, we need to make our stand. So we need to be uh, foundationally nourished by you. We need to train every day. And you supply all the strength and give us all the things that we need to do that and to be on mission. And we thank you for all these things. I pray for my brothers and sisters and for those who are listening or, uh, to this message. I pray, God, that you would bless them and draw them close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for, for this time. You have yourself a great day, a blessed week. Shalom.